I'll be reading on uh, Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 30. So if you have your Bibles and you want to open to that and follow along, that'd be great. Psalm 30, written by David. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. You did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you helped me. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, you healed me. I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O oh Lord, when you favored me, you made me my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O oh Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, or, hear O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. That my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. I'll give you thanks forever. Well, I'm going to ask kind of a corny question. I'll prepare you for that, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Which tastes better? Okay, if you think about, you know, kind of connect with your taste buds right here. What tastes better? A cucumber or a pickle? Think about that. What tastes better? It's not a trick question, okay? I mean, you, you, you obviously know that a uh, cucumber, given the right circumstances, turns into a pickle, right? Well, I know what my answer is. I like pickles a whole lot more because of all the brine and the seasoning that it gets soaked in for a lot, long, long period of time. So when I'm talking about a cucumber or pickle, I'm talking about not a cucumber soaked in vinegar and sugar, just a raw cucumber. Okay, maybe, maybe you folks like that. That's okay, too. Here's another question. What's the difference between going swimming and being a swimmer? Did you ever think about that before? I would never consider myself a proficient swimmer, okay? I once had to t take a swimming test. Of, it was, this was in Lake Huron, okay? I was, in, I was a resident of Wisconsin at the time, but I was at a camp on Lake, the northern part of Lake Huron in the eastern Mi Michigan, uh, UP. And in order to use a sailboat at the camp, you had to pass a swimming test. Now, this was back in 19, probably 80s, the 19, mid-80s, I'll say mid-80s. And uh, so you have to go out a certain, they take you out on a boat a certain, and then you've got to swim back to shore, basically. Well, as it turned out, I took in too much water and had to grab onto the boat, and I didn't pass the test. So later on, 25 years later, I took that same test. I took my family out there and said, hey, I'm going to try this again. I failed. Couldn't do it again. So needless to say, um, swimming and sailing is not, on my, is not in my wheelhouse of activities to do, okay? I don't do them. I can make up these subtle but real comparisons and contrasts all day. For example, going hunting and being a hunter. Is there, any, is there a difference? Did I ever tell you about the time I was, uh, my friend from Washington State, he took me deer hunting one season, and he said I did such a great, day, a great time the first day that he said he'd give me a gun on day two. So. <laughs> How about this one, farming and being a farmer? Fixing a pipe, here, I wish Daryl was here with this. Fixing a pipe and being a plumber. Writing and being an author. Singing and actually being a singer. I, I bet you know where I'm going with this. It's this. Does engaging in Christian activities, aka Christianizing, being a Christian, I mean, or doing Christian things, does that make us a Christian? I don't think so any more than plugging in an electric cord would make you an electrician. Probably not, okay? 
What I'm talking about here is investment. Personal, sacrificial, blood, sweat, and tears investment. In other words, how do you go, how does one go from spraying bacteria, or it's not bacteria, bactine on a scraped knee, how do they go from being that to being a surgeon? Well, investment, right? You invest time and study and discipline and money and training and, and also a conscious decision to deny oneself certain things in order to realize something even greater. In short, to be a Christian, you need an all-in attitude. You've got to be all in, all in. Investing. Being a Christian is an all-in proposition. You're either all in or you're not in at all. It's very simple. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant at all. There's no halfway, no half-heartedness. You can't have a Sundays-only mentality when it comes to following the Lord. I think we probably all know this deep down. We don't, I'm preaching to the choir, I understand. But it's a good reminder. And I think it's a half-hearted commitment that hamstrings the church. And to put it even more bluntly, it handicaps our own personal lives if we're not all in, if we try to half-heartedly follow the Lord. When we try to bounce back and forth between the world, the, what the world offers, and the kingdom of, it's called in the Bible, the kingdom of darkness, if we're bouncing back and forth between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, we suffer immeasurably because it's really a shock to our system. I mean, I, I've you know, I've been laying in my bed, you know, when it's pitch black in my bedroom, and some child will come in and flip on the lights. It shocks my system. And I probably yell and, and, do, and yell terrible things at my kids. It's like hopping on a plane and rapidly traveling through a bunch of time zones to get to Australia. And when we arrive, we, we're there physically, but mentally and emotionally, we're, we're still somewhere back over the Pacific Ocean. It takes a while for us to catch up when we're going back and forth. Here's the good news. God understands our plight about this. He understands that we will be enticed to jump back and forth between what the world offers and what God offers. It's the Satan, Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. He's placed us on earth knowing full well that we're going to have great challenges and trials and temptations and that we have to choose. We have to choose between what this temporary world offers and what God's kingdom offers. Not only for us now, today, but for all eternity. He offers us life, eternal life. Eternal bliss. Uh, 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 the knowing the creator of the universe. And so this will probably be the greatest trial for us, or at least the most significant as far as our eternal destiny is concerned. We'll be answering the question, are we all in with God and for God? Or maybe I could say it another way. Will we just dabble in Christianity like we do our other hobbies in life? We all have hobbies. I, I, my, one of my hobbies is I like to go golfing but I haven't done it for a while. But so I just dabble in it. Once in a while I go, I take my child out to the golf range or something. But other things. We all have hobbies. But will we dabble in Christianity? Christ challenged his disciples in John chapter 6, 53. He says, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like dabbling to me. That's very serious. Many people stopped following Jesus when he said this. They couldn't handle such a commitment. That was Jesus' way of saying, are you all in with me? Are you all in? Are you with me? Are you for me? Or will you just hang out on the fringe and hope to at least claim some of the fringe benefits of Christianity? That's what a lot of people do. They like hanging around Christians. We typically don't stab others in the back. We typically don't go into their house and rob them. 
We typically don't get hired by them, you know, hired, you know, Christians don't go into, into the places of employment and steal from the company. They have some ethics, they have morals, they have, they have a conscience. And so people like to hire Christians because, yeah, they'll probably be honest people. Christian churches, they have some pretty good schools out there. We could send our kids to those schools and they're probably good to get education. Maybe they might even get into a fancy college. If that's your thing. They have good ministries, babysitting opportunities for my kids. So my wife and I can go out and get our, you know, our hair done or whatever. Let the kids off at the, at the, at the Sunday school or latchkey program. We offer some of that stuff here at, at our church. The SALT program is one of those opportunities for parents to get a, get a break from their, from, uh, and we can help their kids. Can make life a little bit easier, can it, when we hang around Christians? So again, the question I'm asking this morning is, do you Christianize, or are you a Christian? Do you go swimming once in a while, or are you a swimmer? Be careful how you answer the, answer the question. Your eternal destiny is at stake there. I've been thinking about this question while I was on vacation. Okay, so I was on vacation. Did some fun stuff. And I was reading Psalm 30, and, and here's what triggered the question. And I didn't notice it at first, but after reading Psalm 30 a few times, it finally struck me. In verse 2, David writes, I call to you for help. And you healed me. Now there's nothing deeply profound about this verse except to say that the help David was looking for and the help that David found was in the form of healing. Nothing profound about that. We ask, people ask God for healing all the time. Help in my relationship, God. Help with my finances. Help with the life, my life's direction and purpose. Help me to believe. Help me in, all, in a number of situations. Help me overcome temptations or, or character flaws or things that we don't like about ourselves. And especially, help to be physically healed. This last request, to be physically healed, healed was probably what David was praying for in this psalm. Help to be physically restored from an illness. And it seems like a perfectly legitimate and logical request, isn't it? Who hasn't asked God for healing in their lives? My guess is that there has been more prayer sent up to God about physical healing than, than all the other prayers combined that have ever been prayed. God, heal me. Heal my friend. Heal my, my father, my mother, my mom and dad because of some sort of physical ailment or illness or injury. And the reason why that that type of prayer is prayed more probably than anything else is because we are physical beings. We live in a physical and a fallen world, and every day we find ourselves in situations that can cause us physical harm. Whether it's, whether it's crossing the street, driving a car, frying an egg with a frying pan, um, walking across the lawn. There's so many ways. When you think about it, we can hurt ourselves. It was about a month ago, or maybe over a month ago now, I was walking out there. I stepped on a small piece of board that had a screw sticking straight up. It went right through the bottom of my shoe and into my foot. And it hurt, hurt like the devil. I'll just say that. And right away I went, it was rusty, so I went and got a tetanus shot. And you think that would be it, but no. I mean, I couldn't walk straight for the next practically two months. All summer long, I'm, I'm hobbling around, could not walk. And I thought, is this ever going to end? Am I ever going to walk right again? That was just one incident. And so it's a small incident. It's very small, but... So we cry out to God, help me. I hate this situation. I want it to be over as soon as possible. That, in a nutshell, is David pray, praying in Psalm 30. And at some level, we can all relate to David. 
Some of you are in that boat right now. Look at that list I just read off of all the people. And that's just probably, maybe not even half of the people who are suffering some sort of injury or illness or affliction or whatever. And Psalm 30 goes on. After that, we not only read about David's prayer, about him calling out to God to help for help, we read about God's divine intervention toward David, don't we? David prays, God hears, God heals. Simple enough, straightforward enough, words and stories and testimonies we've all come to expect from God's word. Amen to that? When we read that stuff, it's like, this is what's supposed to happen in the Bible. There's somebody gets hurt, somebody prays, God answers, he's all healed. We praise God. I cried for help. You rescued me. These are examples. I was sinking down in the mud and the mire, and you pulled me up and set me on the solid rock. I was besieged by my enemies, and you came and swatted them away like pesky little flies. Okay, I made that one up. That's not actually in the Bible, but it could be similar to that. Can't you see that in the Bible? I can see it in the Bible. We're so familiar with phrases such as these that we almost come to ignore them and write them off as, well, that's just typical Bible stuff. That's not real life stuff. But here's what caught me off guard as I'm reading this psalm. I wasn't expecting this at all. In verse 2, David writes, I called to you for help and you healed me. You healed me. Okay, I'm, I, can get on, I can get on board with that. But toward the end of the same psalm, in verse 10, David writes, O Lord, be my help. Do you see the subtle but the seismic shift in David's understanding of God? He went from asking God for help to asking God to be his help. In other words, David wanted God to be his all in all. David went from being a raw cucumber, fresh off the vine, to being dunked and drenched and saturated and seasoned with God's mercy and love and grace. No longer was David satisfied with God's perks and his benefits and the low-hanging fruit that are so readily available to everyone in this world. It says in the Bible, God, God's rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. We all have access to God's blessing, whether you want to follow God or not. Instead, David tastes the fruit of being a follower of God, decided that the fruit itself wasn't enough. He wanted the tree, the source of the fruit. He wanted God himself. Let's face it, many of us, and I include myself in this group, are too often satisfied with God's gifts, and we stop right there. Not understanding that God offers himself, his wonderful, magnificent, amazing self to us but we stop short. Receiving help from God, as wonderful as that can be, it is but the tip of the iceberg with God. He wants to give himself to us. But I don't know if we're ready for that. It's much less scary to keep God at arm's length, to just collect the fruit that falls at our feet, uh, that rolls away from the tree, that's a lot easier to do than go in, go in all for God. We like to hunt and gather on the fringes of Christianity, not fully committing because we're afraid we're going to have to give up something very valuable, something irreplaceable, a, a, a good job, a nice house, a, a lifestyle that we've come to, come to have and we don't want to give up. We'll go swimming once in a while, but we won't become a swimmer. We'll teach on an occasion, but we won't become a teacher. We'll Christianize once in a while, but I don't know about Christianity. I don't know if I want to be a Christian. This would mean I no longer am in control of my life. God would be in control. I can just, I can't trust him to do that. So what do we do? We go on living a life 
That really, what does it do? It eventually loses steam. We can't keep operating this way. It loses direction. It loses purpose. It loses our motivation. At least as far as the motivation we need to build the kingdom of God, to be in the kingdom of God, to be in the kingdom of light. We just sort of settle in. We build a fence around our lives and, and now we can hold on for the apocalypse. It's going to be okay. We can do this. We'll survive. We think to ourselves, you know, when the, when the you-know-what hits the fan, I'll be ready. I've got a stockpile. But will we be ready? We won't be ready if we're just satisfied with God's temporary gifts and fail to take hold of him. Remember what Jesus said to the, all these people who were gathered or following Jesus and he, and, and he had just fed the 5,000? He said, you searching, you looking for me, not because of the miracles and, and the miraculous signs of what that means about me. You're here because you ate the loaves and you had your fill and now you like some more of that. That's a temporary blessing. And trust me, I don't, if anybody likes a temporary blessing, it's me. He says, do not work for that food that spoils, that is temporary, that goes away. That's what spoils me in here. But for food that endures to eternal life, that the Son of Man will give you. And then the Apostle Paul went on and, and said a similar argument in Philippians chapter 3 when he said, I press on to take hold of Christ not necessarily his gifts, although as wonderful as they are. And we say to ourselves, I can't do it without him, obviously. He says, I want to take hold of Christ, for which Christ took hold of me. I want to know Christ. I also want to know the power of his resurrection. I also want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. At the beginning of Psalm 30, it appears that David is praising God for rescuing him, as well he should, because God intervened and healed him, it says. I cried out to God for help, and he healed me. Saved him from certain death. We've all had those experiences. Some we recognize, some we don't even recognize. We realize that God showed up in a miraculous way saved us from certain disaster and we praised him and we gave him thanks and that was and that is good we could write our own psalm if we wanted to but later in psalm 30 david goes beyond praising god for what he's done and praises god for who he is his hope his joy his salvation in a sense david flipped the script he flipped the script from being man-centered to god-centered Once his life was all about his woes and his fears and his pain and his suffering, all very real and very important stuff that we need to deal with in our lives. I grant you that. But in the end of Psalm 30, it's about God's praise. It's about God's glory. It's about worshiping him because of who he is. And the beautiful thing about this is because he does that, now David can face the future. He can face the future. David knows that the blessings of God are not going to stop just because his earthly life stops. We, know, we all know that's going to happen, right? We all know our life is going to stop. Tom Feeblecorn made the decision to say, you know, I'm not going to go through with this major surgery, you know, like to replace a heart, to put a heart pump in. Because, because the, the, the effectiveness is probably like a 20% chance of actually being effective. And so the doctors say, you know, you're okay, you got about less than a year to live. Tom Feeblecorn's heart is going to stop in the next, who knows, maybe he'll beat the odds. Maybe he'll go on for 10 years. I don't know, he's already, according to him, he's already beat that odds at least twice in his life already. Maybe he'll do it again, I don't know. But if he's just going to praise God for the temporary blessings and not take a hold of Christ, 
Well, that's not Tom, though. He's going to. He knows the Lord. And so his praising God, his singing to God, is going to go on for eternity. And he's going to be blessed by God for all eternity. Because, and hopefully like us, we're not satisfied with the temporary blessings that God will roll our way on occasion. He's more interested in saving our soul. David realizes that now he knows that he knows the God behind the blessings. He will be able to give God thanks forever because he knows personally the God who lives forever, the God who saves forever. 